the team we'd sent off had returned to camp with a bag of bones. To the expert eye, those fragments were clearly part of a skull. We'd found it at last, the prize fossil, a skull from Lucy's kind. In the afternoon, when it's too hot to dig, Bill Kimball, our resident anatomist, began to put the pieces together. The world has been waiting for a complete skull of uh, Lucy's species for a long, long time. And it's going to take a great deal of work to assemble it, to uh, see what uh, the brain size might be, uh, what the relationships might be between the various components of the, of the skull. But even already, we can see that as we uh, assemble larger pieces from smaller pieces, joining them together, we begin to get a fairly impressive picture of a species that has a very ape-like face with uh, big protruding brow ridges, very ape-like. We think Lucy's skull might have looked something like this, with a receding forehead and a prominent face. And with a brain case no larger than a chimp's, this was no smart ape. That skull tells us for certain that our earliest known ancestor was a small-brained creature, capable of walking upright, much like modern humans. It tells us that our ancestors first stood up and only got smart later. But why was walking so important in our evolution? In order to understand that, we have to learn more about how Lucy and her kind made a living three million years ago. All next week. Even before Lucy's time, the climate of tropical Africa was changing. There were alternating seasons, wet and dry, and less rainfall overall. The dense forests were beginning to shrink. East of the Great Rift, the forests were replaced by open grasslands with scattered clumps of trees. Before long, the number of apes declined along with the shrinking forests. Except, that is, for one, Lucy, the ape that stood up. How did her upright stance, her ability to walk on two legs, help Lucy and her kind compete in a new and changing world? Lucy probably became a walker while still very much dependent on the forest for food. But when the forest became sparse and times got tough, Lucy and her kind could still survive by walking across the grasslands to reach the clumps of trees where her food was found. And her hands were free to collect and carry the valuable food she found. This slight advantage was all she needed. While the other apes declined, Lucy and her kind flourished. But how did this way of life affect the rest of Lucy's day-to-day -day existence? Can fossils give us any insight into her behavior? Back at the excavation, weeks of hard work and 100 degree temperatures were finally producing results. We unearthed some pieces that looked like an arm bone, the ulna, the bone between the elbow and wrist. We'd never found a complete one before. You know, not only is it important because it's a, a three million year old ulna and, and so beautifully complete, but because for, of what it tells us about Lucy. Uh, comparing it to Lucy, for example, uh, in terms of anatomy, these two bones, both about three million years old, are essentially identical. But it's obvious that the new ulna is nearly twice the size of Lucy. And such substantial difference in body size really has important implications for behavior. These fossils suggest that some of Lucy's kind were much larger than others, nearly twice the size. 
Such enormous differences are seen today in mountain gorillas, and it's clearly related to their social life. This is a harem in which a single large male controls a group of small females. To survive in gorilla society, males have to be much larger than females and have vicious fighting teeth. Finding an arm bone twice as large as Lucy's raised the possibility that the new bone was from a large male and that our ancestors fit the gorilla pattern, that they had lived in a harem. But not all the evidence fits. The landscape Lucy lived in was very different from the lush jungle of the gorillas. Lucy had to range widely in her search for food, and that would have made it hard for a single male to dominate a group of females. And there were other clues that didn't match the gorilla model. Over the years, we found hundreds of teeth from Lucy's kind, male and female. Surprisingly, the males have small canine teeth, just like the females. That could mean that there was no need for males to fight for control over females. Perhaps they weren't living in a harem after all. Some scientists have speculated that the lack of fighting teeth in our ancestors means that males and females were paired off in monogamous couples. For now, the evidence points both ways, but contradictions like this keep us questioning our ideas and looking for more fossils. What we do know is that these creatures were walking like us over three million years ago, and that was a distinct advantage. They could cover long distances, forage for food, and carry it back, perhaps to a faithful mating partner. And what about Lucy herself? What did she look like? We know from the teeth, the jaw, and now the skull fragments we found, that Lucy had an ape-like face, with a brain just a little larger than a chimp's. She may have had dark skin and patchy hair to protect her from the sun. Walking upright freed her hands to develop a more precise grip than other apes, more like our own. And even with her small brain, perhaps she was beginning to have a more human-like awareness of herself and her surroundings. Lucy and her kind must have been extraordinary creatures. We know that they persisted as a species virtually unchanged for over a million years. That's ten times as long as we ourselves have been around. We know that they led relatively simple lives because one key feature was missing from their behavior. Yet a few hundred thousand years after Lucy, some of her descendants made a major breakthrough, a breakthrough that would have profound influence on our own evolution. They began to make these stone tools. Who made these tools and why? They are a clue to the next chapter in the search for human origins. <laughs>